All right, you are good to go, Nancy. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I keep getting messages. There's two people waiting in the waiting room or they've entered or I don't know what's going on. I don't know why I'm getting those messages constantly, but I am. So anyhow, um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Northwest Indiana Green Drinks. And every single time we get together, um, I just want to acknowledge everybody that's taking time to join us and to learn something new and hopefully to be an active participant in what's happening in our region and also in the state of Indiana. This is our 10th year and um, I'm very proud to um, let everybody know that and my hat in appreciation, my hat comes off and my appreciation goes to Kathy Sippel who um, helped us get started and was with us through our painful growing months and um, I think it's really exciting that we're taking in the whole state, the whole Northwest Indiana region now. Also, um, people will join us from other parts of Indiana, and we even had somebody from Canada join us one of our sessions. So it's really very exciting that we're in this new virtual format. Um, sometimes I forget to mention our partners, um, so I want to do that right away. Um, our Events are co-sponsored by um, Save the Dunes and Katie's from Save the Dunes, the Michigan City Sustainability Commission. Um, I guess that's me this evening. And then also we're supported by 219 Green Connect on um, our social platform, social media platform, and also through MailChimp. That's how you get your emails from us. So um, Kathy, thank you for your continued partnership in that area. Um, Kathy also gives me tips every so often about how um, we can um, boost our um, outreach and our participation. So I always appreciate that coaching also. We have a couple of guest hosts this month. One of them is um, WIMS Radio 95.1 FM and 1420 AM. And I joined Rick Federici live this morning on his radio show. And we talked about our program tonight. And then also I'm going to acknowledge um, Indiana University Northwest, the geosciences department, because that's where um, Professor Aaron teaches. Okay, so um, that I think is my introduction, Katie. So um, would you like to take care of the housekeeping stuff and then I'll introduce Aaron after you've done that? Absolutely. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Hobgood and I'm with Save the Dunes. We are a proud uh, co-sponsor of Green Drinks. So just to give you a, a few housekeeping items. Number one, this presentation is being recorded. Um, so that means that if you absolutely love it, you want to share it with everyone you know, that will be an opportunity for you after um, it is completed this evening. It will live on the Save the Dunes Facebook page. And we will also upload it to our YouTube page. Um, there are two ways that you might be with us this evening. So you could be on the Zoom call or you might be watching via Facebook Live. Welcome, whichever way you're watching. Just wanted to let you know that um, if you're interested in asking a question to our wonderful presenter, you can do that either in the Zoom chat or the Facebook comment section of the live event. Um, and then after the presentation is completed, we will get to as many questions as we can. Um, everyone on Zoom is muted. And so we'll unmute at the end. If there's time for verbal questions, we'll, um, we'll do that at the very end. And I think that that about covers it. I will turn right. it back. A housekeeping thing I'm going to add also is we're going to put our announcement section back in. So Kathy Sipple is going to help me remember that. And she does have a, a, a very important and significant announcement to make um, at the end of our program. So don't run away when we're done um, hearing Aaron's presentation and doing the Q&A. So um, I am so excited this evening. Um, Aaron, I, I guess I'll go ahead and say this. She is my favorite presenter that we have returned to Northwest Indiana Green Drinks. And she'll be with us about every two to three years, I'd say. And when she comes, it's always very exciting um, because we're all interested in things that have to do with the um, shoreline or Mount Baldy or the dunes. And um, she's our local expert. Um, 
if when I'd been in school, um, there had been a geology department um, at Valparaiso University, I'm sure that I would be a geologist nowadays. But they only had geomorphology, which is what I would call the soft um, <laughs> science in the in the uh, in the geology of um, our landforms and everything else. So, um, Aaron, um, just you know, heartfelt thanks, and I'm going to say from the bottom of my heart that you'll take time um, to spend with us and to share with us your deep and passionate knowledge about um, our landscape here in um, Northwest Indiana. Thank it's you. It's yours. So, all right, thank you so much. Yeah, geomorphology is part of geology. So I agree with you, with you, John. Um, thank you so much. That was really kind of you. Um, you know, I love spending time with you and you also hold me to uh, keep my feet to the fire as far as delivering information. Um, let's see if I can make sure that shares. All right. So um, I'm also happy to say that, you know, a lot of the information that I'm going to telling you, be telling you, a lot of people will say, well, we know that, which is a really great thing in my career that I've been talking long enough that people are saying, hey, we've, we've kind of heard that before, which is great. Uh, I am a geoscientist, more of a geomorphologist. I got really passionate about shorelines and thinking about human interactions with the landscapes. And so I like to share in this region, especially that is very ecology minded, how I look at uh, the shoreline and just the landscape in general. So sometimes I say, this is the shoreline through the eyes of a geologist. Let's see. Before we start, the public service announcement is uh, in some places along the shoreline, although it's very little, we do still have shelf ice. So I want to remind everyone that this is an unsafe place to be. Uh, here we are in Ogden Dunes looking to the west. This is a picture in this location. This house is going to be kind of iconic as part of this talk. So uh, I just want to remind everyone that these are unsafe conditions, especially right now. We don't want to keep seeing these types of headlines and remember that the shelf ice is floating ice and it does represent a hazard. And there are maps out there if you want to understand a really important thing is that I am an educator first and so I will be sharing again information like there are sites out there where you can go and find out about the shelf ice and its thickness. But as of just last week we were looking at shelf ice only measured to be about two to six inches in thickness so again, uh, not at all safe to be walking on. All right. So I'm going to take you back a little bit to 2018 and another title for this talk could be a tale of two shorelines. So we're here at this house again in Ogden Dunes and you can see what was happening in 2018. The headlines were that at Portage Lakefront Park that this little um, part that this part the, that you stand on has fallen off into the water. You can see the rocks here and clear signs of erosion, broken fences, this broken platform, the broken concrete. And so we were experiencing a crisis in this part of the shoreline. Now I live just beyond this house. Um, back in my glory days, I could jog from my house to Portage Lake from Park. And so this is a picture of my daughter and her best friend, Brooklyn. And they were still just having a normal day, just a couple of miles down the beach. And so these two locations are only about four miles apart. They have the same lake level. So while lake level was rising, there's clearly a different story, just a short distance apart. And that got me really, really interested. At the same time, I was getting calls to help with the project in Michigan City. Okay, in Michigan City, people were complaining that the dunes were getting too big, that they had bought these houses back in the 30s and 40s, and they could see to the beach, they could walk to the beach, and now they have this dune that's in the way, that they have to walk this far distance to the beach, that they have too much sand. And at the same time, my colleague Jen Fisher was working on the fact that there were septic tanks that were falling off into the Great Lakes. And you can see right here, just a ways down in the Long Beach, Michiana Shores kind of area, that the houses are teetering on the edge, suffering from erosion. And again, same lake level, same shoreline, but they're experiencing totally different things. 
And one of the reasons why I get really frustrated is because we have been here before. And I always wonder, what did we learn from the past? These are pictures of the 1980s, 1986, 1987, where we had similar erosional events. You can see that even before the 80s, we had hard structures that were put around some of our buildings. So this is not the first time that we were dealing with these sort of crises, erosional crises in the area. The other thing is that we learned from this story that once the crises kind of abates and the lake levels go down a little bit, all the money disappears, all the plans go back on the shelves and gather dust, and we don't work out a long-term plan. So just to give you an idea of the areas that I was just showing you, we have this section here where, again, I'm in Miller Beach and Ogden Dunes is about four miles away. If we look at Michigan City, to the Michiana Shores Long Beach area, we're talking five to six miles, you know, not vast distances, but again, huge differences in how they're feeling the lake levels. So this left me with a lot of questions. You know, why are these areas experiencing such different patterns of shoreline change when they're so close together and they, they have the same lake level? Are these types of local differences only happening in Lake Michigan? Are we reaching new record high lake levels? Is the precipitation really changing? Is the shoreline changing? And what are all the factors that we really have to think about when we look at the shoreline? So again, I, I wanna look at our area through the eyes of a geologist. And this is a really old image, but one of the first digital elevation models. And so this is all black and white. There's not a lot of extra information, but immediately your intuitive eye can kind of pick out some different features. Um, this big crinkly area in the center, this is the highest area. It wraps around, and hopefully you guys can see my cursor, but it wraps around or arcs around the southern part of the shoreline. This is the Valparaiso Moraine, or more accurately called the Valparaiso Morainal Complex, because there's a lot of stuff in here that geologists talk about. You can even see kind of these channels here where meltwater came down off the front of it. But basically what happened was the Laurentide Ice Sheet came and sat here, right along kind of the north edge of here, and sat here for a while, about 18,000 years ago. And the fact that it paused is significant because glaciers or ice sheets move like the conveyor belt at the grocery store. They move everything forward. So while it sat still, it moved all the sediment towards its terminus or the front, and it just piled it up there along the edge. So we have about 200 feet of glacial sediment that's piled up here, which is why Valparaiso sits so high compared to coastal Lake Michigan. And so they experience different things. Crown Point and uh, really Cedar Lake is another good example of a town that sits high on the moraine as opposed to our more coastal towns like Gary or Chesterton or Ogden Dunes. So you can even see some beautiful things down here towards the bottom, whereas the ice sheet sat there, there was meltwater that flushed across the front as part of what they call the Kankakee Torrent, and it ripped open the area that later became the Kankakee Marsh, and it's nice and flat, you can see kind of the flat landscape that's there. But then up towards the top, we have kind of these broad sweeping features, um, hopefully you can see this feature right here, can everybody see my, Katie, can you see my cursor okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So I like to call this the Grinch fingers. That's the technical term for it. But this feature right here is a spit. We see these a lot off the Atlantic coast and the Gulf coast, but sediment in the Great Lakes, well, I'll say in Lake Michigan, pumps down from the east side and the west side. And that's a really important fact in our story because Northwest Indiana wasn't even here 18,000 years ago, right? After the ice sheet basically receded, meltwater filled this area, but it pumped sediment down into this area. And so the shoreline kind of built, and then when it was flat lagoon, it built this thing that we call a spit with these fingers that stretch out into the town of Griffith, and it's really called the Griffith Spit. Another remarkable shoreline right here was formed during what we call the Calumet phase, also known today as Ridge Road over near IU Northwest. You can go to Ridge Road and you can see it's higher. There are houses that are sitting perched up high off the road and those are actually sitting on dunes. So about 11,500 years ago, you could have sat there and that would have been the beach. And then you see these other arcuate features here in Gary, these are all former beaches. Whereas when you get to the east, 
there's actually still moraine pretty close. And so all of the, the sand, it doesn't stretch out into nice arcuate beaches. It got piled up into nice tall dunes. And that's why we get those beautiful dunes kind of more to the east where the national park is. Well, Gary is gonna have these nice beautiful shoreline features that oftentimes get overlooked. So most of the people that are on this Zoom will probably recognize a map like this. Most of us in the Northwest Indiana are very ecology minded because of the great work of Shirley Hines Land Trust. They've really just done incredible work and thank you to Barb for the maps that she makes that kind of translate the ecology of the area into visuals. And so if you look at this though, you can see that I've overlaid it onto the geology kind of in a crude way, but you can see that we have kind of the Meadowbrook Moraine Forest is up on top of that glacial feature. Again, we get kind of into the flat woods out, and that's also still on some moraine complicated landscape over here. And then you have the coastal dunes, which are part of those features that I showed you again, where they're kind of crinkly in the digital elevation model. And then we stretch out into these long dune and swale, really beach ridge and swale, but I won't get on my soapbox right now. Uh, and these are globally rare ecosystems and habitat um, that we're very lucky to have here in Northwest Indiana. In fact, when I was looking to find a job, um, the fact that one opened up in Gary was just amazing to me because it has, I worked on beach ridges and this has the best beach ridge record anywhere in the Great Lakes. This is another way to look at that same map. So this one just shows you again, everything in, in gray is going to be glacial. And so that's why Chesterton is pretty cool and complicated. How many people are going to the Maple Sugar Festival? I'm gonna pretend that I can see your faces and you raising your hands right now. But remember, maple syrup season starts now. And if you go ahead and you go to Shelburg Farms, you'll actually be sitting on what is the Lake Border Moraine. And I'm going to challenge you right now to take a walk through the ravines and notice the landscape because you only get those steep ravines in an area that's glacial till. You should be able to touch the sediment and see that it has mixtures of clay and sand and gravel. And that tells you I'm in glacial stuff because coastal will sort it by sediment size. You wouldn't have that mixture. So here in the east side of our shoreline, everything kind of gets butted up against that remnant lake border moraine. We still get that beautiful Griffith spit, but it's kind of squeezed out here by the Calumet shoreline. And then everything that we think of as kind of modern is part of this yellow area that we refer to as the Tolleston Beach. It's not a singular lake level phase, which is kind of de deceptive, but it's everything, every land part of the landscape, the wetlands, the ri beach ridges, the dunes that all formed during the last about 6,500 years. And here these white arrows are supposed to again remind you that sediment is pumping into this area from the east and the west sides of the lake and that the shoreline over time has built its way northward, which I like to remind people that geologists often have to core and dig deep, deep down to go back in time because we kind of stack things vertically. But here in Northwest Indiana, it's so special to a geologist because of this longshore drift and the sediment supply, we actually can walk forward in time if we start in a place like Valparaiso or Cedar, Cedar Lake and then walk towards the modern shoreline. And that's why it was ecologically so special because we're getting into younger and younger stuff right here at the surface. And stuff is the, the technical term. But again, another thing I want you guys to really understand is that as we talk about lake level, that's only part of the story about a shoreline. What you see at the shoreline is really kind of a relationship between the amount of sediment that you're receiving and the rate of lake level change. And it also is influenced by what is that pre-depositional surface that you're trying to deposit your sediment upon. So in the east side, we really were jammed up against that lake border moraine. There's not a lot of room to put sediment. So for the most part, we piled it up and we made the tall dunes. So we have these beautiful dunes. If you go back into Gary, it was flatter. 
Okay, it was a very flat predepositional surface created by the till that was left behind by the glacier. And so when the sediment came in, it fanned out instead into these beautiful beach ridges, each one of them kind of representing a lake level stage. And so most people think, oh, they mined out the dunes in Gary, but that's not true. They never formed. They never had the right balance between lake level and sediment supply. This is a complicated drawing. I'm actually going to kind of move through it, but it just sort of tells you that it is the rate of, this is a curry diagram. It's the rate of sediment supply and the rate of water level change that impact the landforms you're going to get. If you have a high rate of sediment supply, but not much lake level change, you just prograde the shoreline. It would build northward for us. But if you have a really high rate of sediment supply, you're going to start building things kind of upward. And if you have a, uh, an absence of sediment supply, you're gonna trigger erosion. And this is meant to be like phase one, two, three, where we really start eroding into our shoreline. So it's a balance. It's not an absolute lake level. And I do want to talk a little bit just about those, those beach ridges because they are near and dear to my heart. Something really, really special about Gary my PhD was all on beach ridges because again, each one of them records a paleo lake level. So we have 6,500 years of lake level that we recreate from the beach ridges here in Gary. You can see in the 1938 photograph that there were over 150 beach ridges. In fact, you can see right here, this arc, this is recording changes in the mouth of the Calumet River, right? And then here in 1998, when our current state geologist, Todd Thompson did his work here, he went in and cored each one of the beach ridges that was remaining. And you can see what happened. We plumped the Gary Airport on top of this. And again, beach ridges are tough for development because you have a wetland in between. And so a lot of municipalities will just come in, shave off the top of that beach ridge, dump it into the neighboring wetland, and you get flat land with a very, very high water table. So geologically, development doesn't make much sense here, but we live with it. And so I do want to give a shout out to Shirley Hines Land Trust and the Nature Conservancy for preserving the remnants that we do have of that globally rare habitat, ridge and swale. And I really want to urge people to right now get really involved, follow these organizations. These are protected, but there are still some remnants left. We have to be careful with how we use the land around them and how we uh, influence the water quality and quantity in those areas. So those beach ridges were key to what I do, which is understanding lake level. This is my crew. And actually, this is one of my favorite crews because this is one where it involved my students. So this is prior to pandemic, right? There's only two units of time prior to and post pandemic. But this is the last big field work that we did. This is Todd Thompson, the state geologist who, like I said, did his PhD in Northwest Indiana and has stayed here ever since. And then um, these are mostly my students. This is the rig that we use. It's called a VibraCore. It's a tripod. And then we go ahead and we hook an aluminum tube to it. And then we vibrate that tube into the ground. The goal is to actually collect beach sediments. When we go into these cores, this is a pit. You can kind of see it. But you can tell what is dune sediment and then what was deposited by the lake level. And we're really looking for gravel. Because if you imagine the modern beach, you know, as you walk from the back shore where you've gone ahead and laid your towel into the water. You cross the gravel where the waves are breaking. And over time, as the lake level changes and the ground lifts in response to glacial isostasy, that gravel layer gets preserved. And so we can go in and core each beach ridge and we'll find the gravel. And that's our indicator of where lake level was. And we can date it using what we call our Star Trek technology optically stimulate, stimulated luminescence where you can date the last time that a sand grain saw light. And this was a game changer because most uh, dating and geologic systems relied on radiocarbon or the presence of organics, which is very, very limited in beaches. 
And then this is my buddy, John, who is doing ground penetrating radar over the beach ridges because we understand that they are created by an entire phase of lake level change, rising, rising, rising and eroding into the beach. And then as lake level falls, we build that beach ridge by blowing a bunch of sand up on top of it, creating an Aeolian dune cap. And it ends up as a beach ridge, a whole cycle of lake level rise and fall. We've been to uh, strand plains, which is what you call a group of beach ridges throughout the Great Lakes. And I just want to show you them. You can see again, this is a really nice one from Manistique, Michigan. And you can see again, the ridges are usually tree lined. And then you have swales, which can hold wetlands in between if there's enough high enough groundwater table. And so we get these beautiful kind of ridge and swale between. And again, most people call them dune and swale, but I get a little crabby and sensitive about that because they're technically beach ridges. They have a water lane core, as opposed to all wind deposited sediment, which would make them a dune. They have a dune cap, but again, I get grumpy and they're really more accurately called beach ridge, dune or beach ridge and swale. So I just wanna tell you a couple of things that we learned from this geologic record. We have seen from all the work that we've done, and we've been in three of the upper Great Lakes, so Huron, Superior, and Lake Michigan, we can reconstruct the Nipissing phase, which was a high phase about 4,500 years ago was the max. It started about 6,500 years ago. Um, we've been able to, to change that people thought it was two peaks. It really is one peak. And lake level was about four meters or 12 feet higher than it is today. And then we've reconstructed that lake level rapidly fell, okay? Again, we did not discover this, but we verified it with the beach ridges. And then we had kind of a high phase in between called the Algoma. And then um, we see these higher phases and then we get into the more recent record. So some important things from that paleo record is we understand some extremes, but I do wanna caution you that the Great Lakes have not always looked the way that they have today. Again, when the glaciers were sitting there, they were super heavy. So when they left, the ground rebounded afterwards. So Lake Michigan, Superior, and Huron were actually one conjoined basin until Lake Superior lifted enough where its bedrock sill at Sault Ste. Marie isolated it hydrologically from Lake Michigan and Huron, which remain as one contiguous lake. And so that separation only occurred about 1,200 years ago based on the work that we've done. And so I don't want you comparing apples to oranges. I don't want you to think like, oh my gosh, lake level could get as high as the Nipissing because that was a different base that we call it kind of the last great lake when those three were conjoined. Today, we can look at kind of the last 1,200 years and see the variability of lake level. It kind of lines up with what we've seen in the historical record. And I'm going to dig into that just a little deeper coming up. But another really important thing that we have seen is that there are 30 year and about 160 year, we call them quasi periodic fluctuations. You're going to see as we move forward, engineers are very accurate and precise. Geologists recognize that there have to be wiggle in every data point that we collect just because of the nature of the data. So we call them quasi-periodic fluctuations. We say they happen on about every 30 years to every 160 years. So that means it's, it's high, it goes low, it comes back up, and that cycle of high to high is 30 years. So this is the modern, well, I should say the, the historical record. This is a historical instrumental record. And most people who deal with Great Lakes water management deal with the record that exists from the Army Corps of Engineers from 1918 to present. It is reliable instrumental data. You can see we have highs, lows, periodic fluctuations. Another really important thing is that from about 2000 to the, about 2013, we were really at a prolonged low period. And that influences people's perception of what lake level should be. So when it started to rise after 2013, a lot of people were kind of taken aback by that. Another thing is that the record high that everyone remembers is 1986, okay? And so when lake level started to rise in 2018, I was like, yeah, you know, Todd and I were super excited because we're like, how often do you see your research kind of come to fruition? He had found from most of his work, there was a 30 year quasi periodic fluctuation, 86 to 2018. Oh, that's pretty good, right? As far as 30 years. So we're excited, you know, aside from the whole like destruction and damage part, we're like, that's cool. So we were 
excited when it started to rise, but it was also really peculiar that we had kind of this prolonged low level. Another thing is we have a longer perspective. And even if we, we go ahead and we just ignore kind of the longer geologic record, there's a, there's a group of engineers that have done work with instrumental data again and have recorded real lake levels throughout the 1800s. And we have this record, it was summarized by Quinn and Selinger in 1990, look at the lake levels in the 1800s, right? So here we are fretting over what was happening in 1986. But if we were to draw a trend line through the 1800s levels, you'd see the average was about 581 feet. Most of the time by us, we think 579. And believe it or not, two feet makes a really big difference when you're on the southern end of the basin, you have a really low gradient or slope to your shoreline. Very small rises in lake level means a great deal of inundation. Okay, so this is what we are flagging everybody off to and saying, you know, the potential we've seen it already to go much, much higher. Okay, so more takeaways. Here's the teacher side. Uh, the paleo lake level record indicates 30 year and that should say 160 year quasi periodic fluctuations. The current configuration of the upper Great Lakes has only existed for about 1200 years when Superior was isostatically rebounded above Lake Michigan Huron. 2020 set a record high for mean annual water level, okay? And this is about 30 years after the 1986-87 high. So there was a lot of talk during that time about climate change. And I got, again, really, you know, kind of salty about that because I was, I had this longer record and I said, we've got to be really careful because if we start screaming climate change and it is really part of the quasi-periodic fluctuation, then the second this lake level goes down, people are going to stop listening. They're going to say, there's no such thing as climate change. And we'll be back with all of those kind of mudslinging, misconceptions, disinformation campaigns that we've experienced whenever we talk about climate change. So I really was trying to get out there and say like, yeah, we have a record high. It is not a purely climate change signal, but there is or are some elements of climate change in there. The other thing is that while engineers primarily use the instrumental lake level data starting in 1918, there are reliable, reliable data from the 1800s. It shows that lake level on average was about two feet higher than the 2020 record high. So let's talk about kind of the history of Northwest Indiana and the shoreline. Back in the early 1800s, around 1834 to 39, we rerouted, we, but they, rerouted trail the mouth of trail creek and built the michigan city harbor structure okay and this was largely to supply wood and building materials or or timber to chicago for the rapidly growing city you can see some of these beautiful pictures that are archived of the michigan city harbor but what i really want you to see is right here on this map where you can start to see, remember the sediment is trying to get down from the east, make its way over to Miller Beach, which is kind of the center of everything, not just because I live there, but because that's where the sediment actually just sort of accumulates. That's kind of the central point. But you can see that already they're drawing in 1934 and in 1939 that we're accumulating sediment on the east side of that harbor structure. And there's some kind of effects on the backside. The same is true in this early map, where you can see again, maybe we are kind of looking at it questioning because it looks like an artist's rendition, but it is extremely accurate. You would have seen high dunes on echelon dunes here along the shoreline on both sides. But again, you're seeing the trap of sediment on the east side, the updrift side, we call it. And then you're starting to see that the shoreline is changing and eroding on the downdrift side. And this is where we're going to see later is kind of the Mount Baldy area. Other things that were happening in the late 1800s were uh, the massive run on mining the 
dune sand. Okay, so as, especially as part of the Monon Railroad, uh, we found out that the sand was especially uniform in size, which is, again, something we probably know and love about the dunes. It's extremely quartz rich. And again, quartz is special because it's highly durable. It's the same material that's in glass windows. It's inert for the most part, doesn't react with many things. And so we saw a run on mining to use this as part of the laying on railroad tracks. And uh, so this is a uh, quote out of a book by Ray Boomhauer. And this is, of course, the Hoosier slide, which no longer exists. Also, by the 19 early uh, or the early 1930s, 1940s, we were dotting the landscape with towns. The area also was known as a respite from the city and the birthplace of ecology. Probably most famous is Henry Chandler Cowles, the pioneering ecologist who brought the Prairie Club to the region and really started again using what I talked about earlier, the fact that we know the landscape gets younger as you get closer to study how the plants actually colonize the dunes and the beach ridges. So here is a perfect study area because the sediment stays the same, the topography generally stays the same, the climate generally stays the same. So what ends up changing is the vegetation and the organisms that are there as a function of time. So you can naturally control many factors in your kind of natural laboratory. The 1960s saw the push for major industry. Okay, so a couple of things that I wanna point out here is that we saw the big push for industry and the battle between kind of Illinois and Senator Douglas, who was pushing for preserving the natural areas with that real drive to create jobs and industry in Indiana and make the most of having a port. So we did have some beautiful and important uh, parks that were there in 1923. It was designated the state, Indiana Dunes State Park. Okay, but it was only in 1966 that we had the Indiana Dunes National Park and of course that's, or sorry, National Lakeshore and of course now that is the National Park. So this is a really complicated area and I probably don't have to tell this audience that, but you can see the red arrows are just kind of supposed to show you major industry. And again, we have communities all surrounded with natural areas that we're trying to preserve. So it's a very complicated area, but the lake doesn't care about any of that, right? So against the backdrop of all that story, the lake is just doing its thing. But I want to show you again, if we kind of, oh, let me go back one second, maybe. Ooh, I don't know if I can. Oh, gosh darn it. There we go. I just want to remind you that it's not just lake level. That's the whole part of the story. It's actually the relationship between the rate of sediment supply coming into a localized area and the rate of water level change. So here we can take a look at the Arsler Middle Burns Harbor area. Okay, and one thing I just want to call your attention to with the white arrow is we are now down drift of Mount Baldy, but you can see immediately what's been happening that we've been building sediment in the area that most people know is kind of the warm water outfall. All right, so we've been trapping the sediment by the hard structure. And forgive the cartoon, but this is pretty well known, right? So whenever you stick a hard structure out into the lake, okay, so it's perpendicular to the lake or the ocean, it is going to block the drift. You're going to have accretion in one area and erosion in another. So whenever you see a beach forming, like we just saw in the previous picture, you should immediately ask yourself, okay, where's the problem? Where is it eroding? And so anytime you, so you've probably all seen next to the houses, how they have kind of those small uh, perpendicular structures, so nicely named groins, um, but they're kind of known as the screw your neighbor technique, right? So you put one little structure out, you think, oh, I'm going to make this nice little weird crescent shaped beach, but on the backside, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to trigger erosion on my neighbor's property. And so what does that person do then? They stick out another hard structure and the problem just cascades its way down the shoreline. So today I'm going to focus on the big harbor structures, right? We've got three big harbor structures, one at New Buffalo, one at Michigan City, one at Burns Harbor. And what we've ended up with is we've ended up with these three Littoral drift cells. 
okay? And on the east side of every one of those drift cells, which is on the downdrift side of the structure, we end up with an erosional zone. And on, sorry, did I say east side? The west, the east side of this zone. Oh, how do I say that? The west side of the harbor structure, the east side of the zone is erosional. In the west side of the zone, we get deposition on the updrift side of the structure. And in between, there's going to be a transport zone that just really doesn't care much what's going on. And we have three major drift zones, although I will say this grossly like glosses over that even on a house by house local scale, uh, we see this happening with kind of localized erosion and deposition. I also want to acknowledge that, you know, I'm not coming up with these ideas. This was well known by Krastowski et al. in 1994. They really focused on Illinois. And they looked at, okay, if you go ahead and you look at all the harbor structures, each one of these little lines and numbers represents how the movement of drift has been interrupted and divided into a little cell. So if you're familiar with the North Avenue Beach and Castaways, you know they've got all of those volleyball centers and they've got every single one is divided by one of those groins and you get these weird arcuate shaped beaches. And over in Indiana, again, we have kind of these three main drift cells. So this is what life looks like if you happen to live in the erosional zone. You are going to experience ongoing erosion. Lake levels will come up, lake levels will go down, but in general, you are sediment starved when you compare yourself with other parts of the shoreline. If you live in the depositional zone, you have a sediment surplus. So again, lake levels will go up, they will go down. When they come up, your beach will get smaller, but you are flush with a large sediment supply. So consider yourselves lucky, okay? And here you can see in Miller Beach, Dune Acres, we're actually making beach ridges. So that's crazy to me. Again, you have so much sediment supply that you are making beach ridges. So we can look at Michigan City again, and Mount Baldy is kind of the example. Here again, we see it's eroding on the downdrift side. 1926, we can see sediment kind of have, has two choices. Either it moves along the shoreline or it goes up and gets blown up onto the landscape. So watch as Mount Baldy kind of grows and encroaches on the forest that's there. 1939, 1958, you can see in the 1939, another thing I like to point out is shorelines just intuitively, they just like to make themselves straight. That's why in Gary, there was kind of an embayment and sediment kind of flushed in there, made beach ridges, and it's just trying to straighten itself out. We've seen it in different parts of the Great Lakes. One embayment fills in with beach ridges, the sediment bypasses it and starts to fill in the next embayment. And so what those drift cells are trying to do is like, once we put a harbor structure in there and erosion gets triggered, then you get deposition in the other spot. They're just locally trying to straighten themselves out. And yes, I talk about them like they have personalities. I do believe that they do and intent. So again, at Mount Baldy, we can look at that. Sediment is trying to go either travel downstream or it's gonna go up. Those are the two directions that it has. And so over the years, we've been watching Mount Baldy. Mount Baldy is known as the living dune. You can see this is my colleague, Dr. Kilabarda and Schillinglaw. They are mapping and looking at these images of how Mount Baldy is growing, but essentially just kind of moving, moving landward, right? Everybody thought that's cool. It's living. That's awesome. Um, but it's not supposed to do that, right? And we have a lot of cultural history of people going here, running up the slip face. Um, but that's not where the problems start. The problem doesn't start at the slip face. It starts at the shoreline and it buries the trees. Here you can see a 2012 photo where we were mapping kind of only in two dimensions, by the way, where the slip face is. This woman is standing on a sidewalk looking at Mount Baldy. Come back and you see my friend Bill and the sidewalk is completely covered. And today, and, and there's actually like a blue line for the parking spots. And today those lines are completely covered and the sand has moved on there um, due to the continued advance of the slip face. So this is a situation I see there. Um, I happen to do some work on the relic dunes that you see here. So hopefully you can see my cursor again. I, uh, I guess I'll leave these off. I kind of inserted some shapes so I could show you the size. But if you look at, if you can see my cursor, you see these dunes here. They're kind of hairpin shaped. 
right? And then look at they're kind of pointing to the east, right? So these are what we call parabolic dunes. They're shaped like a parabola. And what they do indicate is they indicate the direction of the strongest winds, okay? So the strongest winds must have been coming from the west to create this series of dunes. If you look at dunes near the modern beach, they're pointing a different direction. So we have two generations of dunes right here at Mount Baldy. And I've dated these guys. The east facing dunes all show up as about 3,500 years old. Okay. And so if you look at Mount Baldy, you have this east facing dune and the new dune, the historical dune has now encroached upon the older ones. It's actually blown up and over. So you see it's superimposed onto the arms of these east facing dunes. And that's pretty important. This is LIDAR where we go ahead and we strip off all the vegetation to see what the landscape is doing. And so when you look at Mount Baldy, you can see this is an early picture from about 2011. And you can see these are people here just to give you an idea of size. And so with the ongoing erosion at the shoreline, what we were actually doing was cutting into the landscape, blowing sand up on top of the old landscape. And that's indicated by the presence of this paleosol. This is a a paleosol is a buried soil and soils only form on a stable landscape. And so there were trees rooted on the landscape, a whole forest in fact. And then due to the ongoing erosion, we threw sand up on top of that. So it's like we have a dune on top of old dunes. And in, in 2011, the National Park Service took a pretty controversial and aggressive step by de declaring a landform impaired. Okay, and that obligated them to restoring the landform, slowing the erosion and revegetating this landscape, because again, the problem is not on the down the the slip face side, it is all triggered here on the lake side. And of course, while I don't want to go down into the super details of this, um, one of the things that changed my research path was we were out in 2013, on July 13th, trying to collect wind data to understand how the dune was changing in three dimensions when we came upon a family who said that their son was buried alive. And Nathan was buried, actually, this is incorrect. It should be three hours. He was buried a little more than three hours, but he had seen a hole and, um, had fallen into the hole, you know, as a normal six year old would do, they're curious about this hole in the ground and fell into the hole and was buried more than 10 feet beneath the dune. Okay. And so after more than three hours, he was rescued. And this was mind blowing. I do have to tell you, you know, I was there at the time and I just was dumbfounded. I was like, there's, there's no way you could have a kid buried in a dune without digging a huge hole. If you've ever tried to dig in dry sand, you have to dig these monstrous holes. How could he be more than 10 feet down? It was, to me, it seemed impossible. And I kind of carry the guilt of that, of thinking it was impossible. Uh, you know, I'll, I can't even say that I'm over that. And when I called every geologist I knew, they said, nope, no way it could happen. And I was like, dude, it happened. Like it happened. And so we know today, and I, I think most of the people on this call may know, that there were buried trees that were at the root, sorry for the pun, the root of the problem. But doing ground penetrating radar and taking cores as part of our project really helped us reconstruct the internal stratigraphy of Mount Baldy. And again, it's all linked to this shoreline erosion. If you look underneath Mount Baldy, there's clay. OK, so most people are familiar with the clay that's kind of coming out at the surface there. Or if they drop anchor, they can't get their anchors out because they're rooted in clay. Back when uh, the shoreline was forming, there was a barrier beach and it trapped water behind forming a lagoon. This is, you know, an older, older deposit, but is now exposed because we've cut into it. It's usually considered about 6,500 years old, but the shoreline has retreated now back into the older geologic history. On top of that, we have that relic dune that I was telling you about, the landscape that was about 3,500 years old, okay? And a point that I really want to make is this is an undulating landscape, okay? Remember, what we're doing now is we are looking to the west, and so these are the arms kind of going into the page of that 
eastward facing parabolic dune. So we have one arm over here by C4 and another arm over here by C14. So this is one of the most important things that the Park Service has been working with us on is understanding that Mount Baldy is not just like 125 feet tall. You have to really talk about the thickness of the, the sand because the landscape underneath is variable. Okay, so you can see at C4, because of the rise of the arm, the sand thickness is very low. And actually, as the whole dune form has been moving, the sand just kind of blows its way up and cascades down the back. So as we've been watching the slip phase kind of move landward, what's really happening is you are bringing down vertically the surface of this dune and just moving the crest a little bit to the south. I hope that makes sense. So I did this. I kind of superimposed some trees that would have been on the landscape. And so you can see with these oak trees, they usually branch about 10 to 12 feet up off the ground. And so as the dune surface kind of moves and lowers, it brought the surface of Mount Baldy down onto the, through the tree canopy of that tree that was rooted onto the dune arm. And so when Nathan came along, what he encountered was actually the trunk of the tree and um, would have seen a hole that could be 14 to 16 feet or even more um, a nice wide diameter hole that was continuous you know prior to that we've seen limbs they're not too scary but once you get down to the vertical trunk that creates a hazard okay all right so a couple of last minute things is that the shoreline structures block the natural east to west transport of sediment Changes in the rate of sediment supply to the shoreline are visible on even the earliest maps back to 1830s. Beyond the harbor structures, dunes were under pressure and mined in the early 1900s for railroads. Major industrialization in the 50s and 60s modified the shoreline and dunes with hardscaping, dune removal, and more harbor structures that interfered with littoral sand transport. And the shoreline continues to change by redistributing sediment with accumulation of sand east of structures and erosion to the west. This is kind of the situation we're in, erosional zone, depositional zone to the west. And again, the people in the middle don't really, you know, they're not really impacted by it. The sand's kind of moving past them. So a couple of things to point out. While we did peak in 2020, the lake levels are now in the upper Great Lakes, kind of, they're still above average or at average for Lake Michigan Huron and Superior. Even Erie is still above average. Lake Ontario is regulated, but it came off that high again and back down. This is a climate signal. Whenever all three lakes behave the same way, or sorry, three lakes, all five lakes respond the same way, you can be pretty confident to say this is a climate signal. It has nothing to do with regulation. And again, just to kind of show you how this plays out, 2018, or sorry, 2013 in, in Miller here, again, lake levels were super low, record low when it came to the monthly levels. But 2017, they're starting to rise. But again, we're pretty happy on the pain scale. Beaches are smaller, but nothing's falling into the lake because we're receiving so much sediment. On the flip side, if you live in the erosional zone, you are just in a more sensitive, vulnerable area. So even in 2013, during record lows, this is not a beach to write home about, right? This is a still a small, narrow beach. And you can see from the 80s, it's still hard structures around to protect the houses. And then as you're coming up in 2017, no beach. So same lake level, but they're feeling a lot of pain. And I really do like to compare this to my experience as running a marathon. 26.2 miles. When I did it in my 20s, felt great. Okay, try to do it in my 40s. And I don't know, a lot of things have been shifting. I can't do it quite as well. Uh, it's going to hurt a lot. Okay, so that's my kind of analogy for lake level. Everybody said, well, wait a second, we've seen record high levels in 1987. I said, well, don't forget the shoreline has consistently been changing. Its body has been shifting over that whole 30 years. So it is going to feel the same lake level a lot differently this time around. And that's what we saw, right? Portage Lakefront Park. We're concerned about the wetland behind, and it did breach that area. The this, I don't even want to get started on this house. But um, this is built out way too far. 
but you can see again, it was eroding behind here, needed to be reinforced, and even the sheet walls couldn't hold up to it. Intense, intense erosion. Lake level is not the whole part of the story. Again, in 2019, 2020, really 2019, we had so many storms that were just directing winds onshore that these areas just got pummeled, okay? So it was lake level plus the wind direction that was really a killer. And again, shout out to Beverly Shores. Beverly Shores really tried to do the right thing here, again, in collaboration with the National Park, to try to use what we call soft stabilization by putting these bags out here filled with sand to, again, force the waves to break a little farther out to protect the dune right here. Because there's one road in and out of Beverly Shores here along the, the north end, and there were um, natural gas and electric lines underneath. So had this area really collapsed and that road collapsed, you, know, you wouldn't have access to the houses and there would have been quite a disaster. In the end, it ended up with hard stabilization was really the only way to, to um, protect it. So climate, I, I kind of got on my soapbox that I don't want to talk all about climate change. So I want to go back for a second to all the reports that everybody was saying. They're like, okay, lake levels are rising. We have really high lake levels. Here's the precipitation data. You can see they drew, drew a pretty aggressive trend line through that. Um, when I teach this to my students, I warn them about understanding variability versus trends. It is easy to draw a trend line and come up with a, an extreme story. You can see that there is indications that we have rising precipitation in general in the upper Midwest, okay, up until 2020. And that's indicated here by the map in green as well. But again, I, I just don't want you to overlook the importance of variability versus trends. Um, skip that. But... 2021 brought record dry conditions across the Midwest. And maybe that was a game changer or a lifesaver, depending on how you want to describe it. So lake levels came down, okay, returned back to more normal. These are Army Corps uh, diagrams. The blue is average. So you can see into 2021, we really returned back to more average conditions. And you see again where we are now, near average. Still maybe a little above average, um, but you can see the arc of the rise. And again, the most impressive thing is this prolonged period of low and this really rapid rise to the high of 2020. So I do want to impress upon you that there is a climate change story, and I know I'm probably running long, but there is a climate change story. Rainfall patterns are changing, they are shifting. We are getting more intense rainfall events. We have just gone through our winter where you saw this bouncing back and forth between rain events, snow events, freeze, thaw, and that wreaks havoc on dunes, right? So water gets into the, inter into the interstitial pore space of the dune sediments. It freezes, it expands, it pops. So one thing that we really need to start mapping and looking at is not just the wave erosion, but actually what we call mass wasting or slumping triggered by the freeze thaw events that are happening. This is a big issue along the glacial bluffs of Wisconsin. We really haven't explored it enough here in Indiana. The other thing is later onset of shoreline ice shelf makes the shoreline more vulnerable to erosion from intense fall and winter storms. Again, our ice wasn't getting on until end of December, early January. Our most intense storms are October, November. And again, the earlier the breakup of lake ice um, in the winter and spring, the more vulnerable that shoreline is to erosion. Um, we do have a legacy of stabilization. We need to go back and, and complete these maps. The National Park Service did a really amazing job of doing a shoreline study in 2012. Um, I got to be part of that and follow along this whole process. I never been part of it, but there were some really great proposals here and some funny reasons why I don't think they gained traction. Um, some options for better managing our shoreline may be things like, we've been using soft stabilization and sand nourishment. Again, the problem of this is again, you are just dumping sand on the problem and then it washes away. One of the things we really don't have a good handle on is 
is the sand getting around those harbor structures? And when it does, is it coming back into another littoral drift cell? If it gets out into deeper waters, it will never come back into the beach system. So it, if it's getting around the harbor structures, it can be a net loss, okay? It's not like it's gonna move to the next drift cell and nourish that one. It ends up as a net, net loss. Um, we can look at things like the geotextiles. One thing, again, we really haven't fully delved into is no build ordinances. It is time if we're not gonna kind of repeat the, the problems of our past to start looking at no build ordinances. And places that have done that are places like St. Joseph, Michigan. Another thing we can do is try to break waves a little bit farther off shore, okay? This, this picture is kind of extreme where it shows concrete boundaries. That's one way to do it along coastal systems. I don't think or know that we're ready to go that way. The National Park Service had proposed putting the submerged breakwater, which I thought was a great idea, in your highly vulnerable areas, which meant you had cobbles that were under the wave surface that just caused the waves to break a little bit further out, especially in areas like Mount Baldy, and then it just decreased the wave energy. And again, I think that had a lot of problems because we called them cobbles, but to a geologist, the cobble is just slightly bigger than a within gravel by definition so it can still be really really small but for some reason that cobbled term um, really angered a lot of people and then another thing we really have to th take seriously is this idea of planned retreat in the erosional hot spots okay not everywhere but in those areas that are suffering ongoing erosion and we need to look a little closer at how long will they erode like they're not going to keep eroding indefinitely again remember the shoreline is trying to get itself to a more straight what we call dynamic equilibrium condition so if it's just houses on the east side i think it's time to really consider that we can't keep buying our way out of these problems when we hit the high lake levels so if you haven't seen it i encourage everybody to go back to the shoreline erosion and management plan produced by the National Park Service and take a good hard look at it with knowing what we now know after 2020. And even the climate change adaptation plan, again, that kind of predated our highest lake levels and already mapped out the areas that we said had high change potential. And with that, I'm going to leave you at my favorite spot, which is looking directly to the west, where you can see if the shoreline wanted to be straight, this house is right in the way. Okay. So this is one of the hot spots for erosion. This area was breached by the high lake levels, leaving the Portage Lakefront Park um, pretty vulnerable. But of course, we have brilliant engineers, civil engineers at the park, and luckily everything has worked out okay. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and say thanks for listening to me. So Katie, I'll hand it back over to you maybe for questions. Sure. Um, that was fascinating. I never tired of hearing you speak, Erin. <laughs> Thank <laughs> nice. you so much. <laughs> never, uh, never. Um, Okay, so we did have one question in the chat and a little bit of conversation around that, but I encourage if anyone else has questions either on the Zoom or if you're watching on Facebook, um, please put them in the chat or the comments and we will um, get to them now. Um, so let's see, the, the question initially was knowing that hard structures disrupt a shoreline, why do we keep allowing for larger hard structures <laughs> to be built for private purposes? And there was some back and forth with- um, Oh, I'm gonna have to look, hold on, I'm gonna have to look at yeah. the <laughs> okay. um, I think that you, you sort of addressed this uh, at least a little bit on what we could do better in the future. And that one of those last slides about better managing our shoreline. Um, you can thank Nancy for those, so. <laughs> Oh, well, maybe Nancy would like to, to chime yeah, in. Yeah, Nancy, chime in on that. And actually, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of these questions we have to throw back to the citizens of the area and the municipalities of the area. Um, I would like to give a shout out to uh, Orrin Pilkey, who is a researcher out east and was um, a good friend of Lee Botts. I didn't even know that until I was telling her how I loved his ideas. But he would stand up at these Geological Society of America conferences and scream, rip them all out, right? And, and, and of course, that has not happened. Um, but 
again, to, to make this work, you almost have to, you really have to do that, either have sand bypass systems or rip them all out and let the shoreline reestablish itself. But I don't think that really answers your question. I, need Nancy. A I did, I did research on a, a number of those um, solutions that Aaron did present. And I think that one size does not fit all is one of the issues. And um, like the, um, the soft, um, you know, the tubes that are filled with sand or with pebbles or whatever, that only works in places that are in a preventative mode and um, they're dunes, they don't have buildings there, okay? So um, I know Dan Plath and a lot of people were putting those out, you know, in the national park and um, if you look at some of the research, that was not indicated as a good place to do that, okay? Um, the um, pebbles, actually, they're not pebbles set out. They're pretty large boulders that are set out um, further away from the shoreline. And those do work. If you break the waves before they reach the shoreline, it's a very good alternative to putting those boulders right in front of the barriers and the houses and everything else. So a much better use of a lot of those large rocks would have been to have moved them out further into the lake to break the waves sooner. Um, the other thing that you saw was a concrete barrier there with the- um, the um, Yeah, you want me to show it? Cut, the cutout places in it. And that's really great because um, it allows the waves to come in naturally, but it actually, um, it will break the force of them, but they're still allowed to come in. So that's good. Instead of putting up a solid concrete barrier. Um, and then there was one more there. What was that one that was there? I can't remember now. Aaron, there were four of them, right? Uh, in the back. The yes. Soft. There is this, the soft stabilization, the concrete barrier, um, geotextiles, or the no-build ordinances? The no-build ordinances, that's it, yes. You know, there are just certain places houses never should have been put. And a very good example of that is Long Beach in Michigan City. Um, the developers really should have kept that as a recreational beach for all of the people that bought property on the other side of Lakeshore Drive, on the south side of Lakeshore Drive. And then this, this problem would not exist in um, Doonlin Beach, which is just a little bit further to the east of Long Beach. They did not allow building on the north side of Lakeshore Drive, so they've never had these issues um, because of that. Um, you know, lake levels will come up, they'll go down, but it hasn't affected any of the other homes that were built in that community. Yeah, I, um, it's hard to, to get, you know, for people to, to trust that those types of things will work and to trust their neighbors, I think. Um, I, I, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard sell. Um, one, uh, you know, I, I have also heard the pitch about, you know, maybe having like a little creating the artificial islands, barrier islands offshore, which would be another way to kind of block um, wave action, which is what happened kind of up in Green Bay area. And I think it's, it, there has to be a serious conversation about the fact that, you know, are we recognizing that it's going to be a modified shoreline regardless, right? Are, ready, are people ready to take that step and say, I can see Paul shaking his head, right? Right, like with their mandate, especially at the national park to keep things natural, like at what point do you kind of say like, oh, that ship has sailed, you know, and we're gonna do our best to kind of represent a natural, a natural system. And how are we gonna do it in a way that protects everyone's uh, equal access and ecological resources and ecosystem services and all of the words that we wanna say. Um, I do wanna, I don't know if Paul has a comment in response to that since I named him. But okay. Um, oh, if it's oh, okay, I see him almost talking, but Paul talking. <laughs> no, no, he's he's on a head shake. Okay, I do want to say one thing though. John uh, put something in there about the soils being quite diverse in a short distance. Um, 
really important thing to bring up, you know, that that area near Mount Baldy, now that it is underlain by the clay, um, it will respond differently in the sense that now it has a clay layer underneath. If that gets eroded away, you'll get onshore slumping. So that, that's going to be a different type of mass wasting than you'll get in another area where there's not a clay underlaying the dunes. And that's why areas like especially Central Beach are so vulnerable and you'll see these massive erosion events because it's supported by that, that lagoonal clay layer that's still, that's still under there. So you scarp that away and... You know, so if lake levels go back down again, the clay helps it buffer. It actually can form sort of an, an offshore breakwater as well. But um, that was a great point, John, because again, they're going to respond locally very, very differently again um, because of the amount of erosion that's happened. Okay, this has been extremely interesting, and um, I'm going to call it close to the questions and answers because we do want to have announcements tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I want to call on Kathy Sippel, first of all, because she's made a podcast. So I want her to be able to share with you what that podcast is and um, how to get involved with the, um, the Vote Green project. Okay, Kathy, would you deliver that for Thank us? Thank you. Please? Yeah. Wow. I can even unmute. That's exciting. And great, great presentation, Erin. I concur. I could listen to you all day, even if all of it's not super happy news all the time. Um, yeah, Walt. Muller already posted in chat, I see, but I'm going to go ahead and put a link. I interviewed Walt a few days ago about this green voter guide that he's been working on with a group called Voters for Green Indiana. They're a group of citizens that are nonpartisan, they're all volunteer, and they're researching candidates of all parties for the May primaries, and they need some help right now getting volunteers to help them do their research on these candidates for their guide. So I put their website in there and um, there's also a link to the podcast if you wanna you know, hear a deeper dive. And will you allow me one other short announcement, Nancy? This will just be a link. No, absolutely, yes, okay. go ahead. This is um, a, a rather new event that I only just started um, convening online last month. It's called Northwest Indiana Permaculture Meetup. It used to be in-person meetups, but since COVID, we just decided we're moving this online too. So if you don't know what permaculture is, it's regenerative agriculture. And I, I think there are gonna be a lot of great presentations there that if you're interested in that kind of stuff, come and check us out too. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of announcements I would like to make also. Um, the Earth Day extravaganza is going to happen in Michigan City um, for Earth Day. It's happening on Saturday, April 23rd. Um, that's going to be at the Michigan City Public Library. Um, that's Saturday the 23rd from 12 to 3 p.m. It's totally free. Um, this is sponsored by the Michigan City Sustainability Commission. And so far we have 15 organizations that are presenting and there may be still a couple empty tables. So if you're interested in that, um, you can send me an email at Nancy for vision. No, yeah, Nancy for vision at gmail.com. And uh, I'll be sure to get that to Andy Jans Davis, who's the commissioner who is pulling this wonderful event together. Um, she's sort of been on pause hold for two years because of COVID. So we're really very excited about being able to get together and have many environmental organizations there sharing what they're doing. And then um, I have an announcement of our next presenter and I'm very excited about this too. Our next Green Rigs will be on April 7th at 6.30 PM. And Nathaniel Pila, who's a favorite of many of ours is going to be presenting on spring wildflowers of the Indiana dunes. And he just has had a new book that's been published by the Indiana University Press. Um, so he'd be talking about that and showing us many beautiful pictures of wildflowers. And if you know anything about Nathaniel, he makes it extremely interesting. And he talks about boy and girl parts of flowers. So you want to be present to hear about that and to learn what that means. Okay, um, is there anybody else who would like to um, make an announcement this evening? And you can drop it in the chat if you want to, or you could, um, you know, let us know. Aaron. 
Yeah, this is totally kind of random, um, but we happen to have secured. So Indiana University started an office of sustainability in the offices. We. Um, so oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the extent of the office, but we started a sustainability <laughs> speaker series and one of my students somehow secured um, um, Paul Serino, the world renowned dinosaur scientist from University of Chicago to speak at 630 next Wednesday. So wow. maybe I will share the link with you or you can go to the Office of Sustainability website and find that Zoom link. Um, so I hope you guys will come because we never had anyone this big and it's, yeah. it's kind of a, you know, stretch for sustainability, but it, we're selling it as if you don't Act, live sustainably this too could happen to you so um that's how we're that's 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 how we're, uh, that's how we're connecting that thread <laughs> that's great thank you Aaron um I just want to thank you really from the bottom of my heart and every time I hear you present on um shoreline dynamics I learn something new every single time so thank you thank you for feel, feel, filling my um, geomorphology soul and um, just um, you know you're welcome back anytime you don't have to wait two or three years um, to come back to be with us so um, you know I, I thank you everybody thank you. who was here this evening and um, hope you'll join us um, next month also we have a very exciting program let your friends know let your neighbors know let your organizations know let your communities know because it's by us learning and informing each other, we become better ecological um, citizens for our, for our world. So thank you. Katie, do you have anything? No, just that wrapped it up really well. Thank you for joining us and I hope everyone has a terrific evening. Okay, thank you. <laughs>